Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode, we have Guy from the state of Arkansas who wanted to share an encounter that he thought possibly could have been Bigfoot. Arkansas is known for its vast forest and outdoor lifestyles. Many people have encountered Sasquatch creatures such as the Boggy Creek Monster in these remote parts of the country. It's not uncommon for people in these areas to see something strange or hear something unusual that they cannot describe. If you enjoy Sasquatch Theory, please like and subscribe. And if you have had a Bigfoot encounter anywhere in North America, please feel free to contact me. I would love to hear your story. And also, if anyone out there listening would like to become a member, you can go down below and hit the join button and have access to unseen videos. All right, with all of that being said, let's dive straight into Guy's Bigfoot encounter from the state of Arkansas. All right, Guy, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Miguel. How are you? I am doing excellent. Guy, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and your encounters from the very beginning, please. Okay, Miguel, uh, my name is Guy. I live north of Little Rock, Arkansas. I am a retired chemical engineer. I'm 60 years old now. I worked a, a productive career in polymer technology in the state of Texas, where my wife and I lived for... Uh, uh, over 20 years and where our son was born and he's now 29 years old. Um, I'm 60 and um, it sounds like, well, what's uh, may, maybe to some listeners, what's a chemical engineer who had to spend a lot of his life indoors? Well, yes, I worked a difficult taxing career, but I'm also an, a lifelong hunter, fisherman, birder that's like a bird watcher on steroids if you will an active pursuit of birds canoeing camping and just basically all things everything about the outdoors as it applies to nature i've had a lifelong draw to the sounds of nature and it's rewarded me that has rewarded me in so many ways being able to hear a sound outdoors and almost immediately apply the species name whether it's a bird whether it's a say a fox squirrel versus a gray squirrel barking they're different and you can tell the difference with focus and awareness and that sort of thing was that uh, appropriate for an opener? And you want me to go to my first definitive encounter with the Sasquatch species? Yes, absolutely. So you've had this fascination for the outdoors and a passion for it. Where do your Sasquatch encounters begin and what were you doing that day? Okay. Spring, April 19th, 2006. That would be 17 years ago plus a few months from here, our discussion, what today is September 28th. Okay, so 17 years ago was my first definitive in that I was totally aware that what I just heard were not just one, but two Sasquatches uh, speak to each other. Northern Arkansas, Ozark Mountains, the same Ozarks that fill up arguably the southern half of Missouri. But I was in my home state of Arkansas and I was at my solo uh, turkey hunting camp deep inside the lower Buffalo wilderness area. And my tent was set up just a short stone's throw from the small Buffalo River. It was pre-dawn darkness. I had awakened to my watch alarm at 4.15 a.m. on what was the final 
morning of my turkey, my two night, three day turkey hunt. And uh, I had done, I had set my alarm for 415, just ink black darkness at 415. And uh, because I wanted to hike by flashlight for about a mile up Silver Hollow to get to a location where I'd heard a turkey gobble late the second evening. And I said, I'm going to try to be there by daybreak, set up and try to get him. So 4.15, the alarm wakes me up. At 4.30, while I was eating my bowl of cereal breakfast, just still in the darkness of a chilly, chilly morning, April 19th, you say, oh, well, spring's pretty well along the way. The hardwood trees were leafing out, but the leaves were still small on the oaks, hickories, sweet gums, and et cetera. Dogwoods were in full bloom with their sizable white blossoms, and turkey hunters know that that's when that's the height of turkey breeding season and gobbling is when the dogwoods are blooming. So it was midweek. I was solo. I had canoed a mile down river from a from a put in that is just that. There's no housing, no anything. It's just a canoe put in. So I was in the middle of nowhere. I had not seen a human for the two days. And, you know, this day became the third day and still no humans. Not had not even heard a gunshot. Um, and, and 2006 was a very good turkey year for the state of Arkansas. There were a lot of the turkey population was doing fine. So it was apparent to me uh, by the second morning that I've got this whole place to myself. So it was a chilly morning, dead calm. There were no crickets chirping. And you say, well, you can't remember that that long ago. Oh, but I'm very aware when I'm in the outdoors and in pursuit um, I'm aware of the weather. I'm aware of what's going on. So there were no crickets. The whippoorwills had already returned from the tropics by April 19th, but they weren't singing either because it was like 42 degrees on this April 19th morning. So there was not a breeze stirring. And you, you can check me on this, but I know that it was the last quarter moon. So the last quarter moon was essentially overhead, shedding a small amount of light into an otherwise ink black wilderness with no artificial lights of any kind other than my dim little lantern that I was eating my breakfast beside. So here's what I heard as I was, I remember I had a mouthful of Cheerios at the moment. And as, as, as soon as this one and a half second long call occurred that just shattered the stillness of that morning. I stopped in mid crunch to soak it in. And then three seconds later, before I had resumed crunching, a second animal responded from the other side of the river. So this first one came from behind my left shoulder to the southwest of me. The, the return call came in front of me and to the left, to the northwest of me. And I, my brain immediately placed them. It's, it had that feel. They were very loud, but it had that feel of some distance, maybe 200 to 400 yards is still what I think today is each animal was from me. So here we go. I'm going to back the phone a little bit away and try to do my best rendition. And uh, Miguel, just realize I'm going to pause for about three seconds uh, before I do the second one. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. And my adrenaline kicked in, my heart started pounding, my brain immediately ruled out all birds, including the barred owl. And of course, it was nighttime. So, you know, you say, well, a barred owl could conceivably do that. Now, I've heard that they've got quite the uh, vocal repertoire, but this was no barred owl. My mind instantly ruled out all the mammals that are supposed to be in these eastern United States woods. And within a second, 
my brain told me those were Sasquatches. Guy, you've done enough piddling around with research. Now, mind you, this was 2006, so the Internet was about 13 years old. And I know I had probably done a little bit of Internet stuff to kind of on this Bigfoot phenomenon. And uh, I may have even checked a book out from the library one time at that point in my life and maybe kind of read on it a little bit. But it took me back to when I was a kid, when I had seen Roger Patterson's film. And I thought, you know, that looks like a real animal to me. I would have been like six or seven years old watching uh, in in the around 1970 Roger Patterson's film on a television show is all I can kind of recollect and I'm thinking that looks like a real animal and my dad was like no 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 son that's that's a uh, that's a man in a monkey suit and I just remember whenever I thought about Bigfoot here and there as I grew up through high school and college and by no means was Bigfoot on my mind but I always had that feeling that was a real animal but they only live in California they don't live over here well That morning, April 19th, 2006, in northern Arkansas, I I knew slam dunk. They are over here. And still, at that point, I didn't think about the Appalachian Mountains. I didn't think about other forested areas of the eastern U.S. and how prevalent and common this animal might be. But let's just say today I sit here knowing lots more and thinking my gosh how how could humanity have missed this animal for so long but anyway we may get into that some more so anyway with bigfoot on my mind i finished up my breakfast i hiked my flashlight up this you know off trail but up this hollow you know kind of rock hopping my way up shine my light into a cave opening that I had seen on the previous day or two days previous when I had hiked up. And it's like, you know, there's no graffiti here. There's no sign of man. There's no trash on the ground. I'm just out in true wilderness, unfettered wilderness. And I thought, you know, some people think Bigfoots might use caves. Uh, who's who's to say one doesn't crawl up in there to get out of the rain or the snow or whatever. And anyway, I wasn't nervous, you know, no, now <laughs> that knowing that Bigfoot is out here, it's it doesn't frighten me. But I, I have a total curiosity that uh, exists to this day here, 17 years later, about this animal that just eludes humanity to the max, the most furtive thing by far that lives out here. If there's another mammal that's more furtive, elusive than Bigfoot, humanity will never know anything about that animal. So, um, um, do you think the creatures were vocalizing back and forth regarding your presence in the area? Great question. I felt like they weren't pressing me, that that I'm not sure they knew I was there. But as intelligent as they are, they may have known I was there, but they weren't super close to me, like trying to scare me or anything. My feeling was that the first animal said, who up to um, say, I'm over here on the south side of the river. And the other one said, who opt to say, I'm over here on the north side of the river. Maybe it was their way of saying daylight is coming soon and maybe it's time to get back together and and uh, kick back and relax for the day. That was my feeling. Yeah, very well. I think they were communicating back and forth as well. And possibly those could be their locations, like where they hang yes, out sir. at all day long. Because I feel like they're Good. separated Whenever you see these creatures, they aren't always together, and there's always um, a big gap in between, but they're always nearby. Okay. I can I can buy that. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, if you would, go into your next encounter and kind of guide me through all the details, please. Okay. 
This Arkansas thing kicked me off on a more studious study of the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon. I, I sit here today saying I'm very well read on the high end of all the books that have been written on Sasquatch. And by the high end, I'm talking about the books by John Green, Grover Krantz, that would be Dr. Grover Krantz, anthropologist, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, also an anthropologist, um, Ivan Sanderson, wonderful book, Reinhold Messner, the European high mountain climber that spent a lot, a couple of decades of his life in pursuit of the Yeti in uh, Nepal and and um, Bhutan and uh, Tibet. And let's see who else. Uh, Debenat or Debena, a Frenchman wrote a book on the Asian wild man, but I've read e even a, quite a number more books. And then my internet studies, um, in the same way, Miguel, that I found you recently, I could I can tell you're different than so many Sasquatch researchers. I can see that you're you're seeking the truth of this. And that's why I contacted you here recently. The same thing happened to me back in early 2021. We were well into the COVID um, thing, and I was spending some time almost on a daily basis watching YouTube videos on the Bigfoot subject. I came across another man who struck me the same way that you has, has recently struck me. I said, this is the guy I want to contact. And at the end of each of his two or three YouTube videos, he, he lives in eastern Kentucky. Those of you who are savvy, you know that the eastern third of Kentucky are the Appalachian Mountains and their foothills. And while I while business travel and vacations that my family took had landed me in the Appalachians here and there from northern Georgia, sprinkled all the way up into New Hampshire and Vermont. Yes, I had I had sunken my feet into the Appalachians, but I never really appreciated um, what those grand mountains are like until <clears throat> I contacted this Eastern Kentucky man and said, Thomas, would you take me into your Bigfoot areas and show me all these stick structures and maybe we can find a footprint or two? And he said, yeah, come on over. And I said, well, it's March 2021. I'd like for spring green up to happen. Could I come in May? He said, that sounds great to me. I'm like, OK, hang on. Don't you have like 10,000 followers or something? He said, yeah. Uh, and he gave it, it's, it's many thousand. I don't remember if 10,000 is right. And he's been doing his his own private research for 25 years, going back to the mid 1990s is when this man's been doing it and he goes out in the woods almost weekly for 25 years. He's got two Bigfoot areas he likes to go into. And I said, well, well, how many of your followers have called you and asked? He said, you're the first one ever. And I almost fell out of my chair. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. So fast forward two months to mid-May 2021 which as we're talking was just two and a half years ago. I drived um, from my Little Rock, Arkansas home 11 hours to get to his house. And as I'm going across Kentucky, I'm like, you know, I've never been on this um, Cumberland Parkway before, but wow, just what a wild and beautiful place this is. But just a gentle roll across Western Kentucky and then into Central Kentucky. And then a little bit farther on the Cumberland Plateau, it's like, hey, those hills are getting higher up ahead. And they just steadily, with each passing mile, get steeper and steeper. And by the time in the, I got to his neck of the woods, I was like, this blows me away. These are 
real wild mountains forested from top to bottom. And now I look back and I realize people in the Appalachians, they live only at the bottom of the draws of the hollows, Creekside. Everything above Creekside is fully mature forest throughout almost the entire Appalachian chain. Humans don't live on the mountainsides. They don't live on the mountain tops. Yeah, there may be a rare house um, that's uh, perched on top of a mountain, but it's the exception rather than the rule. And these mount every hollow, the mountains on both sides of that hollow are steep, steep, steep. I'm talking 60 degree above horizontal is the norm. And humans cannot safely navigate that. Maybe on your hands and knees and using saplings to help you up and down. But ropes or more technical climbing gear would be needed to do this safely. So <laughs> it was late that afternoon when I met Thomas. He said, let's just go fishing behind my house in the creek and maybe we can catch a few smallmouth bass just to just to uh, um, you know finish off this daylight that we've got left and that's what we did so i'd hit the ground in appalachia and 30 minutes later we were casting for smallmouth bass in the little creek behind his house and uh we caught a couple released them and darkness set in and furthermore, he had said, here, we've got a spare bedroom. You're going to stay with us. So I didn't even have to rent a motel room in the, in the closest little nearby town to uh, to enjoy what would be two nights and two and two plus days in the woods with Thomas. So the next morning we get up early and shortly after sunrise, we drive not too terribly far from his house but just into wilder and wilder country that, you know, there was a scattering of houses along the little rural roadway where he lives, but not far from his place. You're just out in the wild. And it was then a gravel road that met up with another rural paved highway. And soon he pulled over. We got out and he said, I'm taking you into what I call area number two. I said, OK. Well, not a hundred yards off the highway and into the woods, he started showing me the sapling snap-offs. And snap-off might not be the right word, but that's the term I use. At heights six to even nine feet above ground, there would be a two-inch diameter sapling hardwood that was snapped forcefully snapped, but not broken off with fibrous tissue still holding it. And the top of the tree is now touching the ground and the bottom half of the tree is still vertical. And all of you Bigfoot people say, yeah, I know what you're talking about and I'm glad you do. And some of them beyond just being snapped like in a linear fashion, there's a twist on some of them, too. <laughs> it's like, all right, all these big trees around these little trees, they're not blown down. So there's, you know, the physics doesn't allow a, a, a high velocity wind to come through and snap off from some snaplings without blowing over some big trees. And this is too tall. This is too high up. But I could barely reach on tiptoes i'm six foot two and on tiptoes i can reach to eight feet and some of them while standing there on my tiptoes they were broken off above where my fingertips could reach it's like you know if a human did this not only are we not strong enough to break a living two inch sapling um um we'd have to be on a ladder to try to do that well think about a bigfoot and how incredibly powerful they are 
and how tall they are and <laughs> how much higher they can reach than we can. It's nothing for them to do that. So here, 100 yards off this little lonely highway, which is very, very lightly traveled by other cars, like in you know, a five mile stretch, I think one car came from the other direction and there was nobody in front of us or behind us. So a hundred yards into the woods on my first morning, I was like, hmm, this is interesting. He said, okay, we're gonna come to this mountainside seep. Now, mind you, this we're walking on a mountainside bench, about an eight foot wide flat place where a human can actually navigate an otherwise 60 degree steep slope. And, you know, if you want to go uphill or downhill from there, you better be very careful. And like I was describing earlier and get on your hands and knees and grab the saplings to help yourself either up or down, whichever crazy way you want to try to go. And he said, there's this water seep. He said, even in drought conditions, this water seeps across this trail and it's about 100 yards long. And he said, just keep your fingers crossed. Maybe we'll find some footprints. A few minutes later, we were there. And before we even set foot on the mushy area, we were staring at footprints from Bigfoot. And I mean, we'd been in the woods all of what, 30 or 40 minutes, and I'd seen these sapling snap offs. And now I'm looking at Bigfoot footprints. And there was some age to them. The toe definition was basically gone, but from length and width, and those of you who know about the mid tarsal break in the middle of the foot, that manifests itself in a variety of ways in Bigfoot footprints. And I'm not going to go into all the machinations of that unless you want me to later, Miguel, but we can circle back to that. So that hundred yards of wetness, and this is leaf strewn mud. So those of you who may not have been in the Appalachians, you've been in the Ozarks, or maybe you've been in the Washita Mountains of Arkansas or Oklahoma. And there's very few places out in a full forested environment where an animal can leave a decent footprint for you to look at. And you say, well, gosh, send me the pictures of those. It's like, no, and you're going to be disappointed in them because there's leaf matter in these footprints and whatnot. But when you're there and you can look at it at every angle under the sun, you convince yourself that these are big, they're wide, and there is some toe definition in some of these. But it took us two and a half hours of methodical, careful, hands and knees looking at these footprints to get to the other end of the 100 yards of wetness. For two and a half hours, I went through periods of my hair standing on end to my adrenaline gland <laughs> ripping open, just realizing <laughs> that four a group of four Bigfoots walked through this muck not long ago. There was a, a, there were 16 inch footprints. There were 14 inch. There were 11 inch, and we called it the juvenile that had seven inch feet. And I was just blown away, just blown away. So by then, noontime is approaching. And he said, guy, let's go up a little bit farther. There's a real, the, the trail's going to curve. And then trail is an after, is, is, <laughs> is not an afterthought, but a trail is, it's not a trail, it's a bench. And you can tell no four wheelers have been on this thing in years and years and years. The forest is reclaiming whatever humans may have once traveled on this thing. So anyway, we go up, we're only a couple hundred yards past this seat where he said, here, let's sit down on this nice flat rock here in the beautiful woods and eat our lunch. And then Guy, I had already told him about my April 19th, 2006 encounter 
with the who ops and he said i want to film you telling your story so he did and silly me i didn't even realize what the repercussions when i do my two loud who ops what that might incite here in these woods <laughs> and uh let's just fast forward and say you know 15 or 20 minutes into my talk I did those two who ops like I did for you at the beginning of this. <laughs> and then I kept talking at his um, GoPro camera that he was recording this interview on. And not 30 seconds later, when I was wrapping up my talk and this, this too was a calm, no breeze, beautiful, sunny spring day in the Appalachians. It was like 76 degrees. The air felt great, beautiful, sunny day. And the sun's about directly overhead now because it's noon. And we hear, <laughs> and we both jaw dropped, big eyed, looked at each other and said, What could have done that? And Thomas, being a 25 year Bigfoot person, said, That was Bigfoot ripping a branch off a tree. Well, I thought my adrenaline gland had already ripped wide open several times that morning already. Well, this time it ripped wide open and my heart was pounding. I'm like, oh boy, what have I done? And uh, so we sat there and he said, which direction do you say that was? And I pointed over there and he said, that's the exact direction too. We both said 150 yards, maybe 100 yards, maybe 200. We both agreed. Well, as we were assembling our things, getting our backpacks back on, putting our food wrappers and what have you, stuffing them back into our backpacks, we hear. Crash. <laughs> from that same direction. It was an entire tree. It did not sound like a rotten tree, but a living tree crashed down. And as that sound was happening, we both snapped our heads in that direction, expecting to perhaps luckily see. We knew it was the sounds were coming from maybe that same distance, but neither of us saw anything. It was just far enough away to where vegetation, leaf foliage, blocked our view and now my heart is really pounding and knowing we had to go back past this place he said um our only other choice if you wanted to avoid this is to we're, we're gonna have to hike up this mountain and way around to get back to the vehicles and i said no i'm i'm, I'm okay i'm i'm willing to approach this go back past and let's stop and see what we can see so we backtrack on this bench back about 100 yards, 150 maybe, and still not to the mucky muck of this mountainside seep. And we both felt like we're right about in the area and we think it's downhill from us, not uphill. And so we're standing there on this bench looking downward, 60 degrees steep slope down below us. You know, mature forest, but there's a fair amount of undergrowth and a lot of leafy foliage. What it turns out is that that black Bigfoot was uh, 50 yards from us, down below us, pretty steep downhill angle. Through my 8X Leica binoculars, I was trying to find some visibility in an otherwise blotted out wall of foliage. So, and and you say well what were you wearing your binoculars for i never go hunting fishing anything outdoors if i'm especially if i'm in pursuit yeah i don't wear them when i'm mowing the yard or doing woodwork but when i'm outdoors i have my binoculars they make the difference between knowing what's there and never knowing what that glimpse was you got so thomas and i are standing almost shoulder to shoulder looking down and I don't, there were three little tunnels of vegetation or, or where vegetation allowed me to see about 50 yards. 
if if the Bigfoot or if a bird or something had been 20 yards, there was much more places where we could see 20 yards. But seeing 50 yards, there were three little tunnels. And I don't remember if why I looked down this certain tunnel, whether I peripherally caught something naked eye that that made me point my binoculars down there. But I pointed my binoculars down and I could see a big oak tree trunk, almost black in color. Shade probably made it look blacker than it really was. But almost to ground level, I could see this tree trunk. And I realized that there was a black hairy head and a left shoulder of the animal, which would be for us uh, showing from behind this tree trunk on our right. And so I'm standing there rock solid steady looking through my binoculars and the black hair that stood up straight on top of this rounded head of this black Bigfoot and stood up two inch black hair stood up straight on top of its left shoulder. I could see that it was swaying just a slow sway, two inches to the left, two inches to the right, two inches to the left, two inches to the right. And I stood there and I was verbalizing this. It's like, Thomas, there's, it's a Bigfoot or a bear. All I can see is for, I can't see its eyes. I can see its forehead to the top of its head. But there's no bear ears sticking up on it. And he said, no, a bear would have already been long gone from this. And I said, "Okay." And I see the shoulder of the animal, which it all fits together to look like a no neck Bigfoot. And two inch hair standing up all over to the top of its shoulder and its head and this sway, it keeps swaying. Well, for a full minute and a half, my arms were starting to get tired. But I was still watching and verbalizing, it's still swaying, it's still swaying. And I stood up on my tiptoes thinking, I want to see this animal's eyes. And I said, my, even on tiptoes, I can't see the eyes, but it, I think it's looking straight at us as opposed to away from us. He said, oh, yeah, it probably knows we're here. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. And I said, Thomas, and, and just the shoulder to shoulder, he could, this tunnel of openness he could not see what i was seeing and he said man i want to see i want to see i said okay my arms are getting tired all in one fell swoop i'm gonna take the binoculars the strap off my neck just swoop i'm gonna hand them off to you i'm gonna take a step uh, a full step to my left you get right into my footprints and boom boom just in one fell swoop we did that and within a few seconds before he could even verbalize, I looked at his face and I could tell that he saw exactly what I'd been describing because his jaw dropped and his eyes went wide open. And he said, I see what you're describing. He said, yes, it's swaying two inch black hair on top of its head and shoulder sway slowly left, slowly right. But just about two inches is all the sway was with that animal. He stared for a full minute until his arms got kind of tired and then took the binoculars down. I got him back and I looked and I said, it's gone. And he said, it doesn't surprise me that it's gone. But I said, that animal, because I couldn't see its eyes, it couldn't see my eyes and could only see the top of my head and your head. When this was going on, he said, yep, but we paused several seconds handing the binoculars back off to you. And that's all it needed to either escape or he said it could be crawling up this mountain towards us. So I'm like, well, OK, we never heard anything of no footsteps, no nothing. It might have just squatted back down behind that tree and you know, us out there the rest of the day. We don't know. We just know we heard no escape on that calm, calm day. So uh, anyway, while Thomas was looking at it and verbalizing to me, I scurried to the left about 10 yards, trying to find another open tunnel to get a better view of this Bigfoot. 
no luck. I then scurried back to him and to his right about 10 yards, looking, looking, and now naked eye because he had my binoculars. No tunnel of openness to see to get a better look at this animal. And it's just like we got lucky. And I said, well, <laughs> I turned around and said, I could scurry uphill and maybe see through this same tunnel. It's like, no, I can't get up there safely in all this thicket and briars along this bench or I could go downhill a little bit, but no, if I start sliding or rolling, I'm going to be as good as dead here in a few seconds. So it's a, it was a bummer, but it was all meant to be, I guess, looking back on it. It was my, my sighting of a lifetime of a Sasquatch and I'm tickled pink that it happened, but you know, you we all wish for that full blown, full body view, and I don't know that I'll ever get one. But um, I I feel blessed to have seen America's most furtive mammal, elusive. I'll stop there again before I tell you about the next day in area number one. <laughs> and I told told Thomas, uh, he said, "Okay, today, guy." The next morning, he said, I'm taking you to area number one. I said, hey, wait a minute. You took me to area number two yesterday. He said, yeah, I had to see what you were made of before I took you into the big boys territory. And I said, oh, boy. All right. So I'll stop there, Miguel. If there's anything you want to um, delve into on that sighting, fire away. Yeah, absolutely. If you would describe the features on the Sasquatch that you encountered. Black hair, not all of uh, on the forehead, the top of the head, and the, and the left shoulder. Black hair, not all of it was standing up straight. It was almost like certain hairs were standing up straight that almost gave it a halo appearance. But through binoculars, 50 yards divided by eight is about six. Uh, the eight power binoculars, it's like, uh, so 50 divided by eight is about six. It was like six yards naked eye view. So that's the approximate length of a standard room in a house. So that's like, say, looking at your friend across the room in the house. But anyway, that I guess with the sunlight, maybe a little bit of filtered sunlight hitting that animal's hair, it looked like it had maybe like a, a halo, a two-inch halo around the animal. Okay, very good. Can you describe how the eyes look like? Nope. Again, that was a real bummer. I really wanted to see that animal's eyes to see if it had that golden or reddish appearance or what. But even on my tiptoes, I just could not. I guess I could have gone and gotten a rock and found a sizable rock to stand on that would allow me to see it. But I couldn't see the eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. Okay, guy, if you would, go into your next experience, and I'm all ears. So my head, now by the end of, let's call it day one, well, really, it was that I arrived at his house that second, uh, that first evening. Well, we'll call that day one. So by the end of day two, which was really kind of day one, my head was spinning with just all kinds of newfound thoughts on this species. It's like, my gosh, what keeps these animals from being everywhere in the Appalachians? I sit here today answering that question with nothing Nothing keeps that animal from being everywhere throughout the Appalachian mountain chain. And I'm talking northern Georgia and Alabama all the way through New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and the Appalachians technically go up into New Brunswick, Canada for quite a distance. And I'm sitting here today saying nothing keeps that animal from being throughout that entire chain. And just look at the BFRO website or any other website that logs Bigfoot sightings, and there's a nonstop string of sightings throughout that whole chain. 
and I, I say Mother Nature has them packed in to their carrying capacity throughout that whole region because there's not humans, there's not enough hunters or human activity basically throughout the entire Appalachians that keeps them from, uh, you know, being broken up into little pods here and there. Uh -uh. They're, uh, they're at biological carrying capacity, whatever that is. What are their home territories and ranges? Nobody knows. Is it five miles by five miles that supports a family group of them? Or is it 10 miles by 10 miles? You can run the math on the Appalachian chain and you get many, many tens of thousands of Bigfoots when you when you run those calculations. All right, so the second day he takes me into area one, just shortly after sunrise, we're already out in the woods. And he said, guy, if we get lucky, we'll find some footprints from the big boy. And I said, well, how big of a footprints does this big boy have? And he said, are you ready for this? I said, sure, hit me with it. He said, 19 inches long. And I'm like, oh, come on. I've read about some 20 and 22 and even 24 inch footprints, but 19 inches, that would be like a 10 foot tall one, right? He said, he probably is 10 feet tall. And I'm like, holy smokes. Well, about 30 minutes later, we were looking at a trackway through this. This was not, yes, the mountains around it are steep, but this time we're down in a creek bottom, which has a sizable flat region, but it's very mossy. There's a lot of moss and other bright green vegetation of various sorts that plants, ferns and what have you that grow only, only Oh, shin high, maybe some of them to knee high. Well, that's where these animals leave their seeable footprints is in this soft moss, whether it's sphagnum moss, I'm not sure. I don't know those smaller vegetation items by species very well. But the, the stride or step length, Dr. Meldrum teaches us, the Bigfoot folks, that stride is two steps. Step length is one step, left to right or right to left. Not only were these 19 inch long footprints that long, but at the ball, they were seven and a half inches wide. And at the heel, they were fully five inches wide. And one step to the next and we after finding footprints here and there we had to really get on our uh, almost on our knees sometimes to find all right where's this next step well it's kind of on hard ground so where's the next one it's still hard ground we just kind of found blips here and there but and and we said there's no indication this animal is running it just looks like he's walking and you Bigfoot folks also know that unlike us humans who have a straddle where our foot falls, if we're saying pushing off with our left, our right foot, there's several inches, maybe even eight or 10 inches left to right straddle from human step to step. Bigfoot's footfalls fall almost in a straight line. So left foot, right foot, you're looking at a straight line and uh, let's just say we found two spots where two successive footprints were uh, there for us to see left foot right foot and then the next one was right foot left foot the stride length was five and a half feet not uh, step length step length was five and a half feet for me a six foot two man for me to stretch my leg to uh, to try to match that five and a half feet i can't do it without hurting something in a <laughs> sensitive area running yes i can do that no problem sprinting but to just s step that far mm -mm, can't be done and my feet i mean this thing dwarfed my uh, number 11 boot you just put it in there and take the photograph and it's like holy smokes what a beast long story short in that really 
basically two days in the woods with Thomas, my new friend who is still my friend today. I saw footprints from at least seven individual Bigfoots. And and the total number of footprints my eyes laid on was over 100 of them from uh, the two areas that we that he took me into. Very good. Did you happen to get any photos or video of the tracks? Uh, photos galore. And if you're going to ask me for me to send them to you, I can, but it's set up for disappointment. Fast forwarding to May 2022, I came back and this time we spent four days in the woods together, including in different areas. And I cast two Bigfoot footprints um, and have them alongside the uh, plaster castings of of 15 different mammals and birds like turkey and Canada goose footprints I've cast too. I've got a big display down in my man cave and I'm real proud of all the footprints I've done. Most proud of the two Bigfoot footprints and I can, I can, I could, here's what I would do. I'd send you any footprints photos that I, I have, but the ones in the woods, through that dapple sunlight and the leafy mess, they're, they're going to be disappointing to a degree, but the, the castings, I can show you that mid torsal break and how it manifested itself in both the, the smaller Bigfoot and the medium sized Bigfoot footprint castings I've done. But that reminds me, mid torsal break if you if you want to quiz me on any of that i can go through descriptions of how it manifests itself in various ways in bigfoot footprints no i appreciate that i've um researched jeff meldrum's data and um yeah it, ex it explains a lot how they're able to move through the terrain and go up hills with ease and um how they're able to move around us you bet it, 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 it explains the smooth glide that oh so many witnesses of Bigfoot have described. It looks like, you know, a snow skier with the bent knees and the smooth stride. The, the, that mid tarsal break is playing a key role in that, as well as the bent knees of the Bigfoot as he walks smoothly gliding. Even though I've, I've, I've hadn't, I had the fortune of witnessing a, a Bigfoot walking, but I've seen the videos of them like Patty and others, that how smooth they are, smooth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Guy, do you have any more encounters or experiences that you'd like to share? These things, now being <laughs> pretty darn educated, on the Bigfoot and Sasquatch, I, I look back to previous with all the outdoor stuff I've done in my lifetime. I think I had previous encounters at least twice uh, close with Bigfoots and just not having an explanation for any other thing that happened. But that was before I was I had virtually no education on Bigfoot. Oh, they live out in California. That was the days. Oh, they live out in California. Yeah, I saw Patterson and that adult female uh, that he videoed, but they live out in California. No, my other encounters were, well, one of them was in Glacier National Park, Montana. And the other one was where we lived in East Texas when we, my wife and I worked our jobs and where our son was born. We lived way, way, way out in the woods. If you'd like a little detail on those, I can give them, but uh, I'll, I'll let you guide me, Miguel. Yeah, guy, go into your East Texas and Montana encounter, if you would. Okay. East Texas, where we lived for 13 of the 21 years we lived there, we lived, I used to describe it as, to get to our house, go to the very, very, very dead end of the road, and then another quarter mile. Our beautiful little home tucked into the woods on a hilltop overlooking Bacon Creek, B-A-C-O-N, like some people eat for breakfast, Bacon Creek. 
you can go look at BFRO website and see that Bacon Creek and the one it flows into called Tiawichi Creek that then flow into Lake Cherokee, all of which is south of the city of Longview, Texas, East Texas Piney Woods. The uplands are piney, the bottomlands are hardwoods around the creeks. So our house was perched up on a hill looking down into the Bacon Creek bottom. We, for lifelong, we have had yellow female Labrador retrievers. One, sometimes a second one that overlaps the aging years of the one that we're soon going to have to say goodbye to. But at that time, and this was around year 2000, this would precede my Ozarks encounter and certainly the Kentucky stuff that I've described here. And still, yes, the internet was functioning, but I, I was working my job, raising our son, leading bird watching trips, not for pay, but leading bird watching trips almost every weekend throughout the year, and then squeezing in fishing and hunting amongst all of that. It was just a full out uh, active life. So I, I had not begun my Bigfoot stuff. My wife, our recollection is my wife and I, it was after dark. It, it was during the foliage season. I don't know if it was spring, summer, or early fall before leaves fell, but it, it was during the warm season. We were indoors after dark, probably 9, 9.30, watching television. Our little son, he was already asleep in his bedroom, and the dogs, the, these two uh, yellow female labs were inside. They were my hunting buddies and uh, just a part of the family. They're just great dogs to have with anything you do, even take them to the grocery store as long as it's not too hot, hot and you crack the windows for them. They stay in the car and wait for you. Just great dogs. They were indoors with us and both of them instantly snapped to with a growl and um, they um, went to the door like we want out just and things like that would occur from time to time because we had deer going through the I mean we lived in the wilderness man I mean um, not terribly far from the city of Longview but it was wild wild country I mean I hunt did a lot of my hunting just on our property uh, ducks too along that creek Anyway, the, the things would happen, raccoons, maybe they heard a raccoon on the back porch or whatever, they wanted out. So I let them out and boy, they tore out faster than ever and down the thing and just rawr, 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 both of them just barking, just angrily barking. And I'm standing there at the door thinking, man, what in the heck's going on? And pretty soon their barks turned into a yelping that I had never heard from my dogs before or since from my yellow Labrador retrievers. And back up the hill they come and they tear through that open door and almost, if, if I hadn't gotten out of the way in the split second, they would have knocked me down. And back they went into the back bathroom and one of them beat the other one behind the toilet <laughs> and the other one had to just curl up beside the toilet. And I was like, golly. And I went back to Joan and I said, what in the world was that? And she said, that's got to be something like a mountain lion or something out there. And I thought, yeah, that could be a mountain lion. Well, I grabbed my best two flashlights and went out and shined around and didn't see anything in the inky blackness back there. And our, you know, our spotlights back in those days, they were incandescent spotlights and they don't light up things near as well as L today's LED stuff does. But anyway, with those on, I couldn't see anything. Don't remember any odors, even though I didn't know anything about Bigfoot odor back in that day. But anyway, I came in and I said, yeah, you know, the way those dogs acted, that might have been a mountain lion. They might have gotten real close to it or something and it might have squealed at them and I said or it was maybe it was a Bigfoot and she laughed and I said well don't laugh so quick now you know we've talked about this here and there through our lifetime 
And I'm not so sure that's not a real animal. Remember that Patterson film from California? She's like, yeah, 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 man in a monkey suit. Well, you asked my wife today, even though she hadn't been with me on any of these trips, um, is Bigfoot real? She say, you're darn right, Bigfoot's real. It's a real animal out there because my husband has seen them and heard them and all this. Anyway, looking back on that, it's very, very, very possible that those dogs got the living daylight scared out of them by a Bigfoot or more than one. Who knows? But that, too, I don't remember if it was that very night or later on. I said, Joan, do you remember a couple of years ago when I said we heard the awfulest wailing or howling sound <laughs> at night come out of those that creek bottom? And she said, yes, we heard that through the windows of the house, didn't we? I said, we sure did. And I kind of said at that time, that man, what was that? Can a cougar, a mountain lion do that? Well, that was probably a Bigfoot, too. <laughs> so I think I'm done with the East Texas thing. If you want me to tell my briefer story in Montana Glacier National Park, I can recount that one real quick. I'll leave it to you, Miguel. Yeah, let's do that, and um, we'll wrap it up. We're a little over an hour. But, yeah, if you would, go into that next encounter in Montana. This was even a few years before this. Our trip to Glacier National Park was in the 96, 1996. Joan and I had been married nine years at that point, and we took, um, I believe we took two weeks of vacation and spent a week and a half. We flew. And like we always do, we pack all our tent camping gear, our fishing rods and what have you, and took a June trip to Glacier National Park up in northwest Montana. And Bigfoot people will say, oh, yeah, Bigfoot's have been seen in Glacier National Park. Well, this was 1996. Bigfoot wasn't on the brain. And I agree with you, there's lots of Bigfoot reports from Glacier National Park, but this predated all this. We were going for the bird watching, the fishing, the camping, and the fun of it all. And so we flew up there to Kalispell, Montana, and rented a car, and drove into Glacier uh, to the campsite that we had picked up, or campground. And we pitched our tent, which would be our base of operations for like five days. And then we were going to go to the wild, wild western side where very few visitors go because you get down into the low country on the west side of Glacier. And those were going to be the final three nights. And that's where wolves are seen most often. And I said, this is my chance of a lifetime to see a wild gray wolf. And so, so the six days went great. We birded high in the mountains and halfway up the mountains and down near the lake where the, our tent camping was. And we just enjoyed the heck. And we would always steer clear of people. We take the lesser travel trails and this sort of thing. Well, when we got to the western side of this park to pitch a new tent camp for the final three nights, <laughs> we're like, where is everybody? And um, we had trail maps and what have you. And it's like, Joan, OK, on this first day, we're going to walk this trail and just go as far as we feel like. We'll carry our lunch with us and we'll just come back whenever we feel like it. Well, we walked this trail for several miles and lo and behold, it was we started early and in mid morning. I, um, we came upon a pasture and about 100 yards ahead. I said, hey, there's a big buck deer. And this was late June and he had a full rack that was in velvet and he was standing out in this pasture just grazing on whatever grass he was but we we're about 100 yards away so through our binoculars we were watching him we said oh this is great and she said what is that gray thing over to the right of him and I said holy smokes that's a gray wolf and there was a wolf hunk hunkered down in the grass watching this deer and the wolf was probably 50 yards from it so if, if i was thinking nah, it's too far away to try to sprint and catch that deer off guard but i believe he's hunting that deer so we didn't get any closer to mess this up and she said what's that black thing up moving around back behind that deer and i said that's a black wolf and i've read about black wolves 
being in these packs sometimes. And so there were now two wolves with it, their eyes on this deer. And that thing, that black one hunkered down and was watching the deer. Anyway, we stood there for about an hour thinking, go, go, go get, go try to, we would love to see the kill of a lifetime right here in front of our eyes. Well, it didn't happen. The deer eventually filled its belly or whatever and ventured away from the wolves. But I think that deer never knew those wolves were watching it. And then the few minutes later, the, both wolves got up and walked out back into the forest and out of sight. So we continued on. And it was not long after that. We entered this. We were in the woods all along. But this really weird, I don't know if it was black spruce or what but we got into this really dense woodland but big tall trees with almost no undergrowth and when we both entered that thing it was one of those rare times in the outdoors that is spooky man and you can't pin your finger on what it is but my hair stood up all over my body on my legs on my arms uh, probably my hair on my head was standing up and I said do you feel this too and she's like yes this is weird and who knows was there a Bigfoot standing there in quote unquote plain sight that we couldn't just I mean that blended in like they do and we just could not see I don't know but after just two or three minutes I said let's just turn around and go back and call it a day and we did and we were walking pretty quickly because it, it it spooked us both whatever it was we didn't hear anything but it uh, it might have even been a breezy day but when you get into a forest like that it just did calm like everything's muted and all that anyway just looking back on it it might have been nothing at all. It might have just been one of those weird events, but it wouldn't surprise me if there had been a Bigfoot standing there. And you look at the Bigfoot sightings today, and the, they're clustered on that remote western side of Glacier National Park, more so than in the mountainous part of the Glacier itself. But, yep. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that with me. What color was the wolf that you saw? The first one was the standard looking silvery gray wolf that is probably the commonest color. The other one was black overall, but its facial, some of the facial fur was whitish to silvery, more tone towards a typical gray wolf's face, but most of its body fur was black, including the tail. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that with me. What do you think the Sasquatch are and how do you think they got here? The going on what Meldrum, Krantz, um, and numerous other good sharp folks in the Bigfoot community have written about, I put it most likely that it's a descendant of Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus black eye is the one that presumably went extinct some 100,000 years ago. Uh, Gigantopithecus would be the genus name. Black E or black eye would be the species name. But there, that that's the most likely. And when you consider that, did it really go extinct? And why do we think it went extinct? Well, that the reason we think it went extinct is because the most recent bones that have been found of this animal date to about a hundred thousand years. Well, yep. Um, but we found some that are as old as 300,000 years, okay? So you think about today, if there's Bigfoots all over this continent, like some of us think there are, we don't find any bones of recently dead or even thousand-year-old dead 
Bigfoots. And knowing that during the last ice age, which spanned from something like 11,000 years ago to, I'm not sure how far back, I'm, I'm not the greatest of students on that, but for a long time, that bearing land mass, notice I didn't call it the bearing land bridge, like most people who write about it talk about it. It was not a bridge where animals had to teeter and not fall off the left side or fall off the right side and rush over there to the other side. No, no, no. This was a big land mass that furthermore, and what I can't understand is how was it a deciduous and coniferous forest instead of just a big old glacier back in that ice age days? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that, but there is plenty of evidence that suggests that that bearing land mass that connected Alaska to R Russia in modern lingo, but connected those two continents. It was a deciduous forest, a massive deciduous forest with some conifer in it. And so, you know, animals of all types didn't recognize that as a land bridge it's just more habitat for me to live in and so gigantopithecus bones have been found in areas of china and maybe russia that coincided with deciduous woodland temperate temperate stuff not tropical not not um boreal you know, cold season forest, but temperate forest. So you say, well, Jacanopithecus, that, that was its route in into the North American continent. And that's very plausible to me. But there are, the second most likely thing is Paranthrop, I think it's pronounced Paranthropus, was another, there, there's fossil records of Paranthropus which is the genus different from Gigantopithecus. So there's some folks have talked about that that's a possibility. And me, having been gone through the rigors of a science career myself, no, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a zoologist, I'm not a biologist, but I've delved pretty deeply in my studies into these um, uh, science disciplines. It may uh, Bigfoot may be something that we have no idea what its genus and species are. We may not have ever uncovered even thousand or uh, hundred thousand year old, million year old bones of what this genus and species, and maybe even family backing back up the biological scale one notch above genus. Is it in the pongid ape family? Is it in the hominid um, family? Or is it a family all of its own that we have zero knowledge of? I'll leave that open while not. You'll never hear me say that's the most likely thing. I still put that at Gigantopithecus, a uh, descendant of Gigantopithecus, but I'm willing to hear your uh, your take on that, Miguel, unless you've already done so in previous uh, episodes. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's pretty well unknown. When I got into it, I thought they were like an unknown primate species, and then the more I started looking into it, the weirder, the weirder and weirder it got. So at this point, it's unknown for me. <laughs> yep, me too. Okay. Me too. And I, I, I'm in that I'm 60. I don't look 60. I don't act 60. Keep myself fit and in shape. But I know I'm not going to last forever. And I wish, uh, I, I know, Miguel, I think you want to get good video even better than Patterson got but I know in my heart of hearts for us to ever know there's got to be a body taken into an anthropology and a zoology lab just the way this world works nowadays you pick up the field guide to the mammals of North America 
the field guide to the birds of North America, the field guide to the reptiles, the amphibians, every animal in there, are they're there only because a body was put through the rigors of analysis for a family, a genus, and a species name to be assigned to everything. And while all of that occurred in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, for the most part, on this continent, after we had, quote unquote, discovered everything, there's no longer a workable, there's not laboratories necessarily even set up for this. And so I, I just hope it's somebody like Jeff Meldrum and his anthropology lab who gets that body or that body part, if a significant amount of a body, to do the proper work to give it a scientific classification, and uh, which means it, we need either a person with a high-powered rifle with a well-placed bullet to do the work, or Hope that an 18 wheeler hits one at high speed. And hope the driver doesn't get hurt in doing so. And that someone who finds the carcass on the side of the road is educated enough to know that we have we need to handle this properly and get it to the science authorities quick before it gets buried or otherwise hauled away and whatever. Yeah, I agree. Would you agree? Yeah, you absolutely. Do agree. Okay, guy. Well, I think that pretty well covers your story and um, all your encounters and experiences. I want to thank you for being a guest on the show. And if you ever encounter another cryptid or anything paranormal, feel free to reach out to me. Will do. Thank you, Miguel. And I uh, I enjoy watching all your episodes and like your approach to this whole subject matter. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and you have a good day, and it was a pleasure speaking with you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guy. Thank you so much for sharing your Bigfoot encounter and experiences here on Sasquatch Theory. And it's no surprise to me that you encountered something strange in the woods deep in Arkansas. The Boggy Creek story was pretty creepy, and I think the people that actually experienced the Sasquatch activity are the actors in the movie, I do believe. I noticed in the Boggy Creek movie, anytime somebody would encounter the creature, they would take a shot at it, and I think that was just out of fear, but um, I don't know. I don't think it's a good idea to shoot one, but yeah, if someone finds one, dead off the side of the road or you know whatever they find it on their property I think it would be good to um, hand it over to the proper people to analyze the Sasquatch but yeah I think like if I were to keep that it would just rot and stink in my house and I wouldn't know what to do with it so all right I appreciate everyone for listening the returning viewers new viewers people who are sick injured and are just listening to this stuff maybe you're at work I really appreciate you Thank you very much, everyone, and until the next one, be safe and take care.